what was on this morning. Land. Yeah, and, and so a lot can be people can do with their landscaping. Uh, good morning, every or uh, good afternoon, everyone, <laughs> um, and welcome to the Environment Committee meeting um, of the City of Rehoboth Beach. It is Thursday, February sixteenth, um, and I call this meeting to, more, to order at one o five p.m. I apologize for the five minute delay. We were having some technical difficulties, um, but thank all of you for bearing with us, and uh, thank you for members of the public that's here, and Brant from IT helping us run the movie, the uh, meeting. Um, uh, so um, I'm gonna do a roll call vote, uh, uh, attendance rather. Um, Ms. Carolyn Diefendorfer. Here. Um, Eric Seward. Here. Nettie Green. Here. Charlie Garlow. Here. Mary Peck. Here. Joe Vessio. Here. And the chair is here. Absent today are um, he Ms. Heather Metz, and Ms. Catherine Bergwin. Uh, we have a quorum and can, can conduct uh, business today. Uh, we do not yet have the meeting minutes from December 16th available, so we will approve those at the next meeting. Um, we have no correspondence that I'm aware of. Um, and first on the agenda is for us to solidify our um, statements and recommendations to the mayor and commissioners regarding um, the topic of offshore wind, um, and particularly uh, relating to the meeting, the special meeting that was held on September 27th, 2022. Um, the mayor had asked for us to go into a little bit more detail and codify uh, or um, mention a few things on the rationale for our recommendations. I think we were all in agreement that we recommended um, because of climate change and global warming, that the need for offshore wind um, and renewable energy is uh, vital, and that for that reason, most importantly, it should move forward. Um, and there's a lot of other um, things that we discussed. So Charlie put together um, this analysis, um, and I'm gonna ask him to take over, and um, I would like for us to get this off our plate today. So we're gonna make any, we're gonna edit as we need to, as Charlie goes through this, um, so that we can send it off to the mayor and commissioners um, and let it be in their hands on what to do next. Well, so Charlie, I'll let you take it over. I don't know that I'm gonna read every one of the words on here. That's, but, that's uh, perfectly fine. Sort of what we got, this is the format which Mayor Mills had said he preferred uh, to have you know identify the topic and all that sort of stuff. Uh, talks about the concern that we are, you know, climate change uh, and the, how the offshore wind farms would contribute a small amount in helping to curb climate change. Uh, objectives, we want to be, we're suggesting we're in favor of a resolution in, uh, supporting offshore winds uh, based on background. Many nations, other states uh, have done or are doing the same sort of things to reduce their carbon footprint with a host of different projects, solar as well as wind and energy efficiency. Our vision, um, we'd like to see a, a clean energy and a beautiful earth, I guess it basically says. And the inspiration comes from many people who are working on these sorts of things. And then we get down to identify the evaluation criteria, impact on the users. I think this is where uh, it gets interesting. Uh, there uh, are wind turbines in this country off the coast of Block Island, Rhode Island, as we have discussed in previously in this group. Uh, tourism has, has increased there. Residents seem to be pleased with their new wind farm. Uh, so that would be something that would be some guidance. It's not a lot of data points there to show how, uh, you know, wind farms should be good, uh, supported by the people. Um, there, uh, I mentioned here that there are some uh, which uh, argued that the wind turbines would be unattractive, uh, but there are other objects in the ocean, with, like gar large cargo vessels, advertising airplanes, and others which seem to not have caused anyone to object to those. So uh, nobody's abandoned their homes or businesses based on the appearance of those industrial and commercial interruptions of our pristine ocean environment. So why should they have an objection to offshore wind facilities is the, if you will, rebuttal sort of to those who are concerned about uh, visual impacts of wind turbines. Uh, costs, we talked uh, to implement this, that we talked about the request for proposals idea 
mentioning that currently the proposals that are on the, in the news are out there uh, are off of the coast of uh, our state, but this is really a Maryland project. It's not a uh, Delaware project, or at least not yet. There are those of us who are considering trying to encourage Delaware to have some of their own wind farms, but right now, none of the costs of those wind farms are gonna be paid for by anybody other than the ratepayers in Maryland. So we pay nothing for those wind farms. So that's a cost impact. Um, the uh, suggestion's been made that if we do have wind farms off the coast of Delaware, there's a study by the University of Delaware, uh, that's the SIOW report that we've mentioned previously, the Special Initiative on Offshore Wind, I believe that acronym stands for, uh, which pointed out that there were uh, competitive bids, and that's how you can get a lower price, whether you're building your deck or whatever else, is to get a couple of different bids, and who see who's got the lowest price. They got uh, low bids in New York and New England, which came in very uh, low prices, uh, pretty cheap, so uh, even cheaper than our Delmarva power rates. So that would be good for us if we were to go forward with a competitive bid here in Delaware. We're not doing that right yet, but uh, who knows. Uh, as to the Maryland construction of uh, wind farms, that's the uh, US Wind and Orsted Wind uh, Farm proposals that are out there, has an, going to have an impact on jobs. And it's basically a positive impact because when you have construction, you're gonna have construction workers in those jobs. Uh, in Delaware, there will be jobs from based on the Maryland Wind Project in that they're talking about bringing the power ashore uh, near the Indian River power plant, digging underneath or b boring underneath the uh, ocean floor so as not to disrupt uh, the floor, uh, boring underneath of the, uh, um, the beach area so that no one on the beach would see any construction. Uh, there would be construction at, uh, of the infrastructure like substations, uh, it's heavy duty uh, wiring there for electrical engineers and electricians, uh, all of which would uh, create jobs with minimal impact on citizens or the environment. Uh, we talked about increased tourism before and how uh, <clears throat> I added here a little phrase, tourists like to see something new. I'm just back from my vacation in New Zealand and there were lots of new things there because people like to talk about these interesting things. And that's part of what, uh, why people go to see the Eiffel Tower in uh, Paris is it's big and it sticks up, it's kind of interesting. So tourists we think would be drawn to take a look at what we have to show or what might be off the coast. Coastal resilience was another uh, factor which the mayor asked us to address. I didn't see any real effect on coastal resilience one way or the other based on these wind farms because coastal resilience usually includes things like building oyster reefs or higher sand dunes. Now we could include those sorts of proposals in the request for proposals if we were to have such a thing here in Delaware. We could say we'd like you to you know, throw in some oyster reefs. Well then that would maybe bump up the cost of the project, but it would probably provide additional jobs as well. But we're not really, uh, nobody's really been talking about coastal resilience here as to the wind farms that are under, uh, uh, under Charlie, can I, can I ask you a question about that? Um, so in, in some of the presentations that we heard, um, we, we've, I guess, been told that other uh, fishing and, and farming, if you will, um, can sometimes see improvements in these areas where um, there's things for stuff to grow and, and fish may be more likely to hide. And um, is, that, is that a true statement? Does that have to do with coastal resilience? Uh, or am I just completely off in, in my recollection of those presentations that have been many months ago. Yes, in those presentations, they talked about how the uh, pylons that go down to the ocean floor from the wind turbines often are attracting, like any pylon or pier, attracts uh, mussels and other sorts of shellfish, and then other fish come and feed off of them, and so it's improving of the marine environment to have more critters, more life, if you will, in the sea or in the ocean. Uh, and that's a benefit to tourists, which I have not included in here, but I'd be glad to add that in someplace. If you think that it should be under in tourism or under coastal resilience, I'd be glad to. Uh, I, which, whichever you, whichever you think is an appropriate spot, it's just it's something that comes to mind from the presentations that at least jogged my memory. Well, I'll, I'll add that here. Um, let's see, uh, fishing. Uh, may be improved. Um, 
by uh, pylons. I, I, I do. I have a couple of things. I talked about. Yep. Edward, um, I I just pulled up the minutes from our October meeting, and in the October meeting, we um, took a, a vote on um, offshore on our position on offshore wind um, that. The committee is in favor of offshore wind power, but steps must be taken to minimize environmental and, and visual impacts. Um, and we, we passed that motion unanimous, unanimously. I'm not sure now today, is it that you, we're supposed to have a more detailed um, statement on it or, or is, or? Um... Uh, yeah, that's, the, the mayor has asked for more details. Okay. Um, th that was a pretty broad statement. And I do want us to include um, any uh, mitigating steps that we can take positions on as a city to, uh, and I think that following meeting we talked about environmental um, and, and sea life concerns or, or other um, birds and um, steps that we can take to ensure that there certainly is going to be an impact but anything that we can do to ensure that BOEM is, is making sure those impacts are as minimal as possible. Um, yes, the mayor wanted more details, so that's why I brought this back. Okay. Um, and I, I thank Charlie for doing such a good job at, at putting that together. Um, and I was going to wait until after your, you go through this, but I do want to make sure that we talk about the visual, um, the, in, the visual impact at some point in here. Right. Well, I, I believe I addressed it a little bit previously, but we can add more information or verbiage in there as you see fit up under the, uh, uh, the very first thing, impact on users. I, I'd put in some language on there about uh, visual impact. Do you want to add anything to that? I, well, let's wait until the end. Um, thanks. Okay, let's see. We were down by uh, coastal resilience, and I added fishing may be improved by the pylons that attract shellfish. We could add more to that if you want, or? I, I think that's fine. Okay, next, objections to the Maryland Wind Farm proposal and information outreach that may or may not have been done. Um, we talked about how, uh, let's see, the developers, I think put the developers have bent over backwards to keep the community informed of their intentions and proposals. Maybe that's a little bit overboard, I don't know, but it seems like they've issued press releases, they've been appeared at a local chamber of commerce, They've been to civic group meetings. They've been putting things on their websites. It seems like that they are, you know, they've hired full-time people, if you will, to reach out to the community and to answer questions and to, uh, you know, whatever they can do to help out to make sure people understand what's going on or what they have on the on the table. Uh, they had previously provided monies to, to improve the park facilities down at Fenwick Island, uh, as suggested by Denrick and the Parks Department, but. Local folks down there uh, objected strenuously to any uh, improvements that, or disimprovements, it depends on how you look at it, that were proposed. Uh, but you know, basically the developers were trying to help out, so they went to state officials and that's what they were told would be a good idea, but others didn't like it, so they withdrew that. Uh, they are making other generous offers to try to improve the local environment as well. They gave a grant to the Delaware Center for Inland Bays, which as you may know is a local uh, environmental group that helps the inland bays. So uh, what would make us feel better about offshore wind farms? And for this, I'd seek your input as well. Um, I'd said it would be great if we'd build more wind farms if we need to reduce climate uh, because the threat is dire. Uh, that's my uh, opinion on that topic. I don't know what the rest of the uh, committee would feel. Uh, other states are getting ahead of Delaware in terms of constructing port facilities and other sorts of things. And we're losing out on those jobs which might be Delaware jobs to the extent that we're not making faster progress, that we may be dragging our heels. Uh, anybody else have anything that you'd like to suggest that would make us feel better about these offshore wind farms? I'm open to edits or comments or whatever. If not, I said, what else should the city of Rehoboth Beach do to keep our community informed? That was a phrase that was requested by the mayor. Uh, and we I suggested that we might have whole periodic meetings at City Hall to keep the citizens updated on progress and to provide a forum for concerns and objections that people may have if there are developments which are not to their liking. Uh, I suggested the mayor ought to take a crew and go up to Rhode Island 
and even you know Massachusetts farms, uh, New York wind farms, see what they're doing, uh, what, what we can learn from them. If they've made some mistakes, maybe we can learn from their mistakes and not have to make the mistake and, and do it right down here. Uh, anything else that you would like to see uh, the city of Rehoboth Beach do to keep our community informed? I, I actually have um, one thing. Um, I think it was at the at that September meet, or it might have been De December's meeting. Um, Edward, you had mentioned they uh, the gentleman that was here from I forget what, what one of the two groups. There was a gentleman here in December. A gentleman Chris from Basin from Orsted. Orsted, okay, and he made the comment. I think that it was the last day of the comment period on something. And Edward, you had mentioned that that was the first you were hearing that that the comment period was was closing. So I think we need those um, those companies to be more forthright with uh, requests for comment on things and make sure that the city knows that there's something out there that they are looking for comment on so that we can add our comments. Um, and um, Charlie, why you, I, and I think that's a great thing to add is um, sort of, uh, and maybe the appropriate, well, I, I think that is an appropriate spot. Um, I will say that um, just recently, um, I did get a, a letter from uh, Mr. Basin um, informing, informing me um, uh, I'll, I'll just share it with all you now, um, that, the, that BOEM has issued a proposed renewable energy modernization rule, which would be its first major revision of offshore wind leasing, permitting, and safety regulations since they were first issued in 2009. The proposed rule contains eight major components, eliminating unnecessary requirements for the deployment of meteorological uh, um, met buoys, I guess, increasing survey flexibility, improving the project design and installation verification process, and establishing a public renewable leasing schedule, um, re reforming BOEM's renewable energy auction regulations, tailoring financial assurance requirements and instruments, clarifying safety management system regulations, and revisiting other provisions and making technical, technical corrections. Um, and he said, in my opponent, in, in his opinion, component number four, which is the uh, leasing schedule, um, is particular is of interest of coastal towns, um, and telling me that the comment period is due on or before March thirty first um, of twenty twenty three. So it was uh, my intent to bring this rule and these eight components to our next meeting. Did they provide a link to the rule that we can get ahead of time and go through? He did, yeah. Okay. So it was my, this is from two days ago, so I okay, was intending yep, to yep, send yep, this yep. out okay. Um, okay. To, to have a separate discussion about that. Okay. The, um, but, I, but my point of that was, I think he's did, demonstrating yes, that they're, yes, they're now agreed. taking that step, but agreed. I think as a city, we need to keep checking in to make sure that we are being informed of, of things of, of that nature. Agreed. Thank you, Carolyn. You Is have, this phraseology um, something that you find? I'm sorry. I, I guess I, I know that you're participating with the organization of coastal towns, and I had the impression that BOEM um, is connected with your group, and I wonder if you're, you have a connection with BOEM, a person that, you know, a link to, to hear if all these things that BOEM is doing rather than having to get them secondhand from, from the developers, whether, um, you know, there's a way that the city can follow stuff without having to get uh, uh, notified by Orsted or, or U.S. Um, so I do know that the first time that BOEM got connected to the Association of Coastal Towns is after that meeting on September 27th. Okay. Um, that was the first time that a connection had been made. 
Um, until that point, it had been rather difficult um, for ACT to get sort of any response from anyone. Um, in fact, um, including DENREC, which it was, uh, we were not sure that we would even would have a representative, at, uh, at that meeting, a representative from DENREC. Um, so it really is from that date forward that these connections started, started happening. Uh, to, and we had a very good conversation that afternoon uh, with representatives of, of BOEM and our consultant that we hired. Um, to what extent that has continued, I don't know. The mayor has been attending those meetings, um, and much of those meetings have been held in executive session uh, for various reasons that the Association of Coastal Towns may, may want to meet in. Um, so I will, I will have to get back to you on, on how extensive that connection has been. Thank you, Carolyn. Is this language uh, any, in need of any improvement? We need to have the developers inform the city when there are comments due or upcoming. No, or I, I, think, I think that's good. Okay. I think that's good. I also uh, added some language about BOEM sort of making the effort to try to communicate with us as well. Right. Maybe we can get on a mailing list and we get right. things automatically without us having to ask. Yes, yes. Um, the <clears> other <throat> thing where there was the talk of, um, you know, offering Fenwick um, dollars to um, take care of their park. I think to the extent that any uh, wind or any um, connections are coming in across any part of Delaware, what, and especially with, if it's within the city limits, that we ensure that they will return whatever they have to disturb to its original, you know, form, mm -hmm. that they, um, you know, do any kinds of repairs, that kind of thing. But I think we need to make sure that anything they do puts the land back to the way it was or I think, better. I think that I have seen the suggestions that, that it's going to look exactly like it did before, except for a manhole cover. They're going to want to <laughs> be able to crawl down in there. Uh, I don't know if you've True. seen that. TV True. show about sewer but, rats But maybe they can something. make it, you know, look like a, you know, some kind of coastal, you know, type thing. Make it look pretty. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, if anybody has additional language we ought to add into that, let me know. I'll just continue on with some the rest of it. Uh, this is part of the mayor's format report on committee analysis, pros and cons. Uh, it says the wind farms will save money and improve health, uh, <clears throat> as well as protecting us from climate uh, damage. Uh, the cons, there will be some inconveniences, adopting new measures, upgrading the existing equipment. There will be some of the disturbances that mm -hmm. you're talking about, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. uh, the final committee recommendations, we recommend that we support offshore wind while staying informed about new developments and to the extent that there are opportunities for us to comment on impacts and how we can reduce them, that would probably be mm -hmm. part of what we're staying informed of so we can comment on it and if there are, you know, problems that arise, we should be able to comment on this as well. So that's all I have. Um, Commissioner Chersnowski, do you want to accept comments from the public? Our friend Dave um, Stevenson, I, I know here is from- uh, First want to see if there's anything um, anything else from the committee. Yeah. The, the only other thing I have to add is on the recommendation, I thought at a past meeting um, you all discussed making sure that, you know, it there was limited impact to the, um, uh, you know, the environment itself of putting in the wind farms and trying to minimize that. So I think it's important to include that in that statement. Yeah, we definitely had that as our right. recommendation. Right. And, you know, to the extent they can minimize the impact to the view, that's great. But the lease areas are where they are, and I don't think we're going to be able to do anything about them. Well, I, 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 I disagree with that um, in, in, in that... At least for, um, for example, the U.S. Wind Project, everything we've seen and what we saw was phase one, right. which was the southern easternmost of that leased area. Right. They could build out closer to, the, um, to our shore if BOEM allows them mm -hmm. to move to phase two. Um, I think that...
because that's not been approved yet, I think that advocating yes, for that agreed. may have an impact. Agreed. But I mean, um, I don't know that we're going to have any success in going f out to 20 or 30 miles because I think there were I, reasons for them not to go that far out right. with the shipping channels and the migratory channels right. for the birds and the whales and, you know, that. And, and I think that the people that spoke to us, I don't know whether it was Orsted, but someone was saying at one of our meetings, and I can't remember which, that um, that they were going to turn off, you know, turn off the turbines. Right, I do when, remember that. When a whale pod, mm -hmm. you know, came yes. through. Yes. And Agreed. so I think there, I mean, I think there is mm -hmm. a lot going yeah. on with Yes, that. and I, I think yeah. Boehm has demonstrated that um, that they're very seriously concerned about environmental impact and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, or that's why this is such a long process, and they require so much in their comp plan. And um, yeah, for for example, you know, they they have very strict rules on if there's a whale or a dolphin in sight as they're building these right. wind, right. wind right. farms that they they have to seize mm -hmm. for a period of time until right. there's right. there's not one in sight. Right. Um, Edward, um, I did not realize until I read the, sto uh, the story in the Cape Gazette that um, the Beach and Boardwalk Committee has also been tasked with yes. making a recommendation and that um, I don't know whether they've done so or not, but um, I, I don't know if it's a good idea to have two different committees on completely different tracks for the mayor commissioners, but... Um, well, I, I think it's good for... for I mean, as a as a commissioner, I I want to, I mean, I, I want to be able to see all perspectives. Um, I I intentionally have not listened to or, or read anything that Jay Legree and his boardwalk committee are are talking about. I do think um, that they're getting very much in the the weeds about details, whereas I I intentionally did not want us to get in the weeds. And be a little bit more broad. Um, well, I guess from their they're not they're not looking at it from the environmental point of view. I guess they're looking right. at it from the tourism um, point of view. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Right. And it, and I think that we address that. We yeah we we've addressed we've that. Addressed, and yes. I think yeah. Right. Um, so I do I do. Um, That what impacts there on that last? Are we talking about environmental impacts or visual? I think, envi I think environment. I think we should say environmental um, and visual. Environmental. I spelled it okay. Great. Yeah. Visual impacts be minimized. Yep. And I feel, um, Mary, particularly with the several committees looking at this same issue, again, there's a need, I think, for us to work together. And of course, okay. this is going to be down the line. But I, I really do think sometimes we spread things too thin, <laughs> you know, and we need to come together for environmental concerns. Um, I, I would ask uh, for um, to add just one more one more sentence on this. And that is to advocate that, one, the state be more transparent um, about the process and what they're, um, what's in front of them, because they have an approval process with all of this, too. Um, and we have heard very little from the state and DENREC. Um, in fact, there used to be a offshore wind uh, committee made up of different representatives and stakeholders, um, and that has ceased to, to meet in a very long, I, I think, eight or 10 years. Um, so I think we need to advocate for that. Um, we also should advocate that any disturbance, as Carolyn mentioned, to um, our parkland or 
uh, shoreline needs to be restored um, if to what it was, if not, if not better. Story. I guess one thing that when you're talking about the state um, that we could ask is really that the state put together um, an, another um, way of community, the coastal communities um, being able to give, interact with the state. I know when G Governor Carney first took office, he had a, um, an offshore wind committee that he formed with the idea that the state was going to decide what its position was. And then that he, they went through a year of meetings and they didn't come to any conclusion. And then they kind of uh, disbanded the committee. But um, maybe, and I, I learned when you put together the, um, the big event, when Denrec was there, I learned some things that I didn't realize that um, the state was involved in. I didn't know what their role was, but now um, I know a little more, but um, maybe they should have some um, way of, of getting the, the, town, the affected communities um, to be able to give input on the state level. And that, that, was, that is the first time that Denrick has ever showed up to any of these public meetings, despite being invited um, to share that information. So um, I, I, f I agree, Mary. For me, that was, I was shocked, actually, um, at how involved they would be in the process and what approval um, you know, they, they are required to give. So um, all right. I, uh, for me, I think it looks pretty good. Let me just mention one other thing, not for that, but just so you all know. Um, my husband was at the last meeting, and he was the one that was asking the question about the fire suppression systems on the turbines. And he did end up having a conversation with the gentleman from, I believe it was Orsted, that was here. The, the guy followed up, and they will have fire, that group anyway, will have fire suppression systems on their um, windmills so that when they catch fire, there will be, um, uh, you know, monitoring for, um, for the fire and to, to uh, dispatch, um, like, fire boats to them, but they will also have some fire suppression systems with on, uh, you know, on the turbines themselves. Great. Thank you for mm -hmm. that follow-up. Um, anything else? I'll go to the members of the public. Copies of written comments. Uh, could you, sure. Could you just uh, state your name and yeah. your um, association? Jason from the Caesar Rodney Institute. I'm the director for energy and environment. Uh, I've been doing this for over a decade. I've been working on offshore wind since uh, 2017 when the Maryland Public Service Commission first approved projects for off the coast of Delaware. I testified <coughs> at the September 27th uh, hearing. Uh, my, I didn't know you were doing this today. I'm rather timely. I was just coming to comment to give you updates on some things that have uh, been learned uh, since that September seminar. Uh, but I also uh, maybe have a comment on a couple of things. Yeah, uh, abs absolutely. I, I was not on that um, uh, working group that the governor put together, but I attended every meeting and made comments to that meeting, so I can give you some updates on that. Uh, as I said, I was going to say I have uh, uh, some copies of written documents that Sure, sure. Like uh, Charlie, do you want to grab those and just yeah, pass I'm them gonna, down? I'm going to summarize these for you. Uh, for example, the, there's two documents. The first document, uh, half the document is... Oh, yeah, if you can just... Yeah, uh, half the document is uh, references of where, of where all the information is coming from. Uh, so trying to give you as much as we want. So, so first of all, just to go back to, uh, and answer your question about what happened with that committee. Uh, they met uh, monthly for a year. And uh, heard from a lot of people. And um, at the end, they did write a final report. And that final report had uh, two specific recommendations. One that was that the offshore wind was so expensive, an option, uh, that uh, Delaware should not participate in the existing U uh, US wind or, or skipjack projects. Uh, at that time. The second uh, part of it was that 
at some future date, and this was done in 2018, uh, but at some future date, we could consider it again if the cost of offshore wind came down. But part of that recommendation was that if we do consider offshore wind, it should be compared against other options. And uh, that's very important because real, real quick summary here, um, U.S. Energy Information Agency estimates the cost of various uh, uh, generating uh, options. Offshore wind is, is about four times as expensive as onshore wind, solar, uh, natural gas, uh, and then in between the two, uh, just a, 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 give you a number, it's uh, roughly $136 per megawatt hour for offshore wind. You can build solar at 36, you can build uh, onshore wind at 40. Um, and then there's, no, there's, new, there's newer options becoming available. There's a lot of work I've spent the last two years digging deeply into carbon capture at existing power plants. And that's looking very, very promising. There's a plant in Texas that uh, um, they're about to capture 5 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, uh, from, a, from a natural gas power plant. Um, and then there's also advanced nuclear, which there are now nine different uh, programs going to build the next generation of, of nuclear power. And that looks very promising. And, and even that, um, the numbers they need there are um, roughly $75 a megawatt hour versus offshore wind at 136. So uh, there are other ways to meet the issues of reducing carbon dioxide uh, than offshore wind. It's the most expensive way you can do it. I just completed, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Republicans took over the House in, in the U.S. Congress, and uh, one of the new folks uh, running one of the committees is Representative Jeff Van Drew from Southern New Jersey. Uh, he is going to be holding hearings on offshore wind. He asked me to take a look at the New Jersey three projects that were approved and look, look at the economics of that and the carbon dioxide savings from that. And as you dig into it, um, New Jersey's thinking they're going to save 7 million tons of carbon dioxide, but when you really look at the details, it's more like 3 million tons. Um, and when you look at the cost, uh, they're looking at uh, spending $8,500 per ton of saving carbon dioxide. Uh, Delaware participates in a program called uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative where uh, folks have to buy, uh, electric generators have to buy carbon credits. Those carbon credits are selling for $14 a ton to put that $8,500 in perspective. So I've, I'd like to see carbon dioxide uh, uh, reduced but man, offshore wind is a great way to do it. That's, that's kind of off the topic of why we're here today. Um, some of the new things that are going on, neither Skipjack or US Wind have gone through an environmental impact statement yet, but we have other projects that have. One of the first one was the Vineyard Wind Project, there's one called South Fork Wind. Um, after that, Ocean Wind in Southern New Jersey uh, came up for its draft environmental impact statement. Since then, Empire Wind in New York and uh, just uh, uh, Monday was the deadline to send in comments on the Virginia project. I have gone through the environmental impact statements on all of those projects except South Fork and have put public uh, comments in. So I wanted to let you know a, a few of the things that are going on. Boeing, I mean, Boeing goes through this and they decide whether a uh, impact is uh, major, minor, negligible, or nothing. And there are five key things, or six key things, that, that they have said are major impacts. And you need to know, you need to understand this. And it's, it's consistent from one environmental impact statement to the next. These are major issues, and none of them have mitigations. So the first one is, Boehm admits commercial fishing uh, will abandon project areas uh, which will cause, cause financial problems for the commercial fishing industry and also can impact food security. And this is Boeing speaking, this is not me. Uh, structures will lead to radar interference, vessel collisions, and interfere with search and rescue missions, 
is already impossible with human deaths. That's almost an exact quote. Undeveloped ocean views will change to views dominated by industrial sized turbines, uh, possibly causing uh, tourism jobs and lowering beach community property values. Uh, I do want to read you a, a quick, this is a direct quote from Rowan. The daytime presence of offshore turbines, as well as turbine nighttime lighting, will change perception of ocean scenes from natural and undeveloped to a developed wind energy environment. In clear weather, which by the way, in Wilkesman, they find about 85% clear weather. In clear weather, the turbines would be an unavoidable presence and dominate views of the coastline. Boehm anticipates that the overall impacts associated with, with, with the turbines when combined with the impacts from ongoing and planned activities, including other offshore wind projects, would be major. And then they go on, by the way, and, and say, uh, yeah, it's going to be a major visible, visibility, going to be a major impact. Uh, but, but gee, it's not going to cause uh, any loss of tourism or financial. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, other things, military operations may be harmed by radar interference, impacting national security. Scientific research will be impaired, including essential data to determine seafood takeaway. Um, they literally have said, uh, we don't know how we're going to figure out what the population of various seafood, uh, uh, the, the ones that we fish for, uh, they don't know how they're going to figure out how many we can take. So that's a pretty big deal. So let me go, let me go back to the visual uh, problems a bit. Up until uh, June of last year with the Ocean Wind Environmental Impact Statement, uh, Boehm was saying visibility of the turbines is a major impact. But we have this study from the University of Delaware that says, we see, we did a survey, we see that at 15 miles, as many people said that they will uh, uh, not like the view has said they would think the view would be better. And they have been using that University of Delaware study to justify saying there is no economic impact. Starting with the Empire Wind EIS, which came out in November, they have stopped using the University of Delaware study. Now, you might be curious, why are they stopping? They said they didn't use the Virginia one either. So right now, they have no scientific evidence of, of why this major visibility issue is not going to impact the environment, or the, 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 the tourism and property values. And uh, <clears throat> by the way, that would be viewed in a court of law as uh, arbitrary and capricious and would be thrown out. If you're going to say that we have a major impact and it's not going to have any economic impact, that's crazy. So, so, so the second pa paper I gave you is why, why all of a sudden did Boehm stop using that paper? Uh, because of your seminar. Uh, we had a pretty lively debate, uh, Jeremy Firestone and myself, and at the very end of it, Jeremy Firestone admitted that there would be a, 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 an economic impact to tourism and property values. He just didn't give any details. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, I'll... I'll, I'll stop you because I think we, we all get your point and I, I for one, am, am very aware that um, asking each individual's opinion on whether the visual impact would have in a change in where they go to visit or shop, um, it is very arbitrary and it's, it's very subjective. Um, and I put very little weight in that UD survey. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone else has a comment on that, but I, I... I think we have no idea what will happen. I mean, I, I, I don't think we can deal with this, with fear. And also, cost. You, you talk at the beginning about cost. To me, the much deeper, greater costs are the hidden costs, which we're dealing with in the Environment Committee. It's, it's more than dollars and cents. It's the um, hidden cost, if, if we don't do this, to our environment and to us as human beings, if, if we 
if we don't. And there's also dangers in nuclear power. There's power that's used going into capturing CO2. So um, I, there are these hidden costs and <laughs> that are much greater cost than dollars and cents. Can I can I ask you? And I, I'm going to ask. I'm just going to give you a few more minutes. We we do have a lot more in the agenda, but uh, it's very clear. And and I think we've all studied a lot of your material, um, both publicly and and on our own. And obviously, you were a part of that presentation on September 27th, and we appreciate that, and we appreciate your comments today. Um, you and your organization are clearly against offshore wind. Yes. However. That is beyond our power. Um, Boehm has leased these areas to these companies. Um, they are reviewing comp plans um, for them to proceed. We are uh, trying to take realistic steps that we can to uh, protect our coastal community um, as well as um, realizing that climate change is a, is a real problem um, and it's pretty scary. Um, and, you know, if we don't have a coastal town in 20 years, does it matter what the economic impact is? Um, I, I, and I think those are all realistic things that we try to balance with everything. So you, you are against offshore wind. What do you have anything concrete that you suggest? that the city of Rehoboth do? Uh, yes. I, I, at least you should be neutral at this point because you don't have much control. Secondly, um, there are new lease areas. I forget what you mentioned. Uh, there are new lease areas becoming available 30 miles off the coast. Yep. And uh, right now, the uh, OM does not have the ability to swap a lease area from one area to the next. Uh, we have been trying to get people to sign petitions, and the city, we would invite the city of Rehoboth to do this, to uh, uh, Senator Carper and others in, in the U.S. House and Senate to pass a law that would allow Boehm to swap a, a lease area that's too close to shore for one that's far enough out. It, is there anything in the pipeline? Is there any U.S. congressman or senator willing to to propose such legislation? Is there anything drafted? There is nothing drafted because okay. not, not enough beach communities have, have asked for it. And uh, I mean, it's the beach communities that are gonna have, that are gonna have to make this change. And this is, I mean, th this is something that can really be done and it would take away that threat because we don't know how much, how much economic impact, but even, Jeremy Firestone said there is going to be a negative impact on property values in Florida. So we can have you can have offshore wind and you can uh, uh, still and not have that threat by moving these things further offshore. And the city of Rehoboth could pass that resolution and, and get the rest of the coastal towns to do it. Fenwick has already done so to try and, and, and get these uh, uh, these swap areas so that it's further offshore. Okay. So we're not arguing about reducing carbon dioxide. We're arguing about the best way to do it. And this is the worst way to do it. And uh, the, other piece, the other piece that I wanted to comment on is what's going on with the uh, uh, North Atlantic right whale and the impacts that that is having. Uh, uh, to give you real quick highlights on that, uh, the biological opinion has to, of whether we're gonna endanger the right whale is comes from the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. So Dr. Sean Hayes at the, at the Fisheries Service has recently written an opinion that there should be no offshore wind project within 20 kilometers of where there's any active whales. Now, I, I'm sorry, can you cite where that came from again? Yes, yeah, if you've got a reference. Okay. And um, I can tell you that just about every one of the existing uh, lease areas, including the ones off our coast, would not meet that requirement. 
the right whales. Uh, if you look at, uh, like I said, we, have, we don't have the economic, I mean, the environmental impact statement for, for the ones off our coast, but New Jersey, right up the coast, Ocean Wind, uh, admitted that the North Atlantic right whale is in those lease areas commonly and year round. It's not that they're there occasionally, they're always there. There's a brand new study that just came out weeks ago from German researchers that looked at the impacts in the North Sea. And those impacts on the whale were that there's a turbine wake effect that changes how, uh, how much oxygen gets in the water, how much, uh, uh, and how much uh, zooplankton concentrates. The, 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 the right whales need to have concentrated zooplankton to feed. And there's a, there's a term, term and wake effect that, that, when you have, that, that causes that to be too low a density for the whales to really feed, which means they have to go further to find food, which means they lose weight, they lose weight, they can't have calf at the end of the day. So that was another major, uh, that was another major problem. Journal of Acoustical Science, there was a, a recent report that the operational sound of the turbines is probably going to exceed the uh, uh, harassment levels for the whales. Let me um, yes. interrupt you for a second. Um, so you, the, the two projects that are currently in the pipeline for off our shores haven't reached the environmental impact statement yet. So I would certainly hope that these issues would be analyzed at that juncture, and um, and I guess we would all probably want to see what the, all this, um, these issues are very important that you're raising about the whales, um, wh how that is analyzed and how they're gonna do it. And so what is the process, if you know, um, when they file their, their environmental impact statements is that where, where does where does Rehoboth come in? I mean, can at that point we can comment and and review? Yes, there is. A, there will be a draft environmental impact statement. So for U.S. Wind, the, the first step is uh, Dom reviews the construction and operations plan. Uh, they have done that. There was a comment. They published that. They published it and said, we think this plan is complete. Um, uh, there's a 30-day comment period. They've gone through that. So the next step, and it should be fairly soon, will be they will come out, uh, Dawn will come out with a draft <coughs> environmental impact statement that you can comment on. Uh, in that, I can tell you, the, the draft environmental impact statement, what they're doing at Dawn these days is cutting and pasting. Uh, you know, as I said, I've looked at four of these, five of these, and uh, the last three, it was almost the exact words to the entire thousand page document. So, uh, and it's going to be the same exact problems and they're not addressing it. Dalton is not addressing it. They're, they're approving these projects, despite the fact, uh, particularly that they may be endangering, uh, the, you may see the end of the North, uh, North Atlantic right well. Uh, well, Mr. Stevenson, I, I thank you very much um, for, your, for your comments. Um, you, I'm going to ask you one question. I, I'm almost positive your comments here today are going to probably have little impact on what this committee does. Um, but I get another chance to vote on this, um, where I suspect we will have a lot more public comment at those mayor and commissioner meetings. You made several comments about uh, Boehm making clear statements that uh, commercial fishing would abandon the areas that radar um, maybe um, it may interfere with radar and, and such. Are those, and I'm, you just gave this to us, so I didn't read through everything yet. Are those comments specifically referenced in here? No, what I, what I can do, is, what I can send you is copies of our comments on Ocean Wind in New Jersey, Empire Wind, and the Virginia Wind projects, where those things are, we, I do address them, and there's references, uh, just like this paper, there are references to where everything is coming from. Please, I, I would, one, I, I'd like to receive this electronically so we can embed it in our correspondence so members of the public can. I wasn't sure the email address. And I, I, these report, the two reports I just gave you were, were written in last week. 
Okay, I, 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 I will give you my email address um, so you have it, um, but I would also like to reference those comments that you made from, from Boehm, so I, so I have them. I thank you very much for being here. Any other members of the public on this topic? No. Um, any other comments from the committee? No, other than some of this stuff does concern me. You know, um, military operations being harmed, you know, um, uh, that's a concern for me. Is, and it, um, so, so let me, let me ask this. Um, Mr. Stevenson certainly said that, um, but do you see that referenced anywhere? No, I, I didn't read through that. I was right. trying to pay attention. So, um, um, no, and I, I, I suspect, so. I suspect that if the military had concerns about yes. their operations Agreed. being mm -hmm. compromised, mm -hmm. I suspect that they would be right. Right. actively yeah. involved yeah. with the yeah. federal government, yep. at least from my perspective. I think the most important thing for us is to just stay in the process and, and know where our common and response points are and not miss the boat on anything. I agree with you, yeah. Mary. And I, I would like to accept these recommendations that, that Charlie's put out for us. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Nettie, I'm sorry. I'm, because you are so very important and I do love you very much, <laughs> but because you are a non-voting member, I'm gonna ask a voting member okay. to make the, sure. the okay. motion. Okay. I want a motion for me to uh, adopt and send forward to the mayor and council members our report as edited today. Uh, yes, we have a, a motion from Mr. Charlie Garlow to um, accept the analysis report um, and our recommendations to the mayor and commissioners. Do I have a second? A second. Okay, we have a second. Um, I will do a roll call vote. Um, Ms. Carolyn Diefendor. Um, I, I will agree that it should be sent forward. Okay. Mr. Eric Seward. I agree as well. Ms. Nettie Green. I agree. Charlie Garlow. Aye. Ms. Mary Peck. Yes. And Mr. Vessio. Yes. Uh, and the chair abstains from voting. Um, as I said, I, I get a chance to vote on this again. And to be quite frank, I'm, I've got a lot of concerns, but I also see a lot of value and I'm unsure, but at the end of the day, I, I get a, a real vote at this um, uh, later. So uh, the motion passes. I will um, send this off to the mayor and commissioners. It will be, um, Involve, it will be in our mayor and commissioners meeting tomorrow. Um, and I'm glad that we've got one thing off of our plate. We can, <laughs> can move on with some other business that we've been um, straggling along. I, Mr. Stevenson, I want to thank you for being here and, and all of your comments. Can I give you one of my business cards? Uh, Should we email me? I can email you back as well. Uh, Mr. That would, that would be great. Thank you. Good to see you again, Dave. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is going to be the offshore uh, wind. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Offshore yes, wind. I, I am just... <laughs> Uh, it's it's it yeah, yeah you, you want this to <laughs> full, fun, you know? full meeting. Sorry, there, it's been a very <laughs> hectic couple days and so far today. Um, we're gonna, this is no less hectic. We're going to go to uh, B, which is uh, discussion and potential vote related to gas-powered landscape equipment. While I pull the policy up, um, I'm going to let you just start it off, Nettie, with the, a brief description. The gas-powered? No, oh, no, I'm sorry, Mary. Mary. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll just, okay. <laughs> um, so just to kind of remind you what the, where, we've, what, where we've been. Um, so um, back in, in the uh, last time we met, I had a proposed ordinance with a schedule and phase, a phased approach. And um, we all agreed 
uh, who were there that day that we, we would recommend this, except that Ed asked me to take out uh, or just to put in an exception for chainsaws with blades over 14 inches. Um, and so I added that. Um, and so that's basically what we agreed to. But I also wanted to, <clears throat> and I've added this as I recognize that in the meetings where we've had heard from the public um, and the um, commercial operators, the main, if I understand it, the main objection that I heard was that some residents don't feel that it's fair to have their lawnmowers um, banned. And so um, I have sort of like a plan B. If the commissioners, um, I don't want them to just reject the whole proposal because of this one issue. So if they, so I'm proposing that um, uh, as of December 31st, 2027, uh, lawnmowers would be, gas powered lawnmowers would be banned. But in the alternative, um, if they don't want to ban lawnmowers, at least um, go with uh, the ban on the handheld equipment and bans for commercial operators. So. Um, for those who were here uh, at the last meeting, I don't know if you ever got a hard copy or, an, or a digital format of what, what the proposed ordinance is. I think you, you did, but um, I know Ed had it up, so we, we did vote on it. But um, So now what you're seeing or will see today is just essentially um, revised to exclude these large chainsaws and... Um, and then I have the ordinance with, I d broke it into three um, parts. First, as we all agreed, the city and its contractors. And then second, all other commercial contractors that have a later date. And then uh, residents have the, the, la the latest date. And each of those three categories are broken into um, the handheld and then the, the lawnmowers. And so, um, so it's sort of, uh, currently the dates and every time we have put this off by another month you know the dates might seem like they're starting to get closer and closer but um, so the first date that I had was this December of 31st for the city itself to um, ban their uh, gas power equipment and then um, then I, I go into um, the 2025 for lawnmowers, and then for commercial operators, 20, the end of 2024 for the hand power, and the end of 2026 for the lawnmowers, and then for residents and property owners, um, the end of 2025 for handheld equipment, and the end of 2027 for gas power. And so that's a recommendation with, um, yeah. in the, um, in the, paragraph that I have as summarizing, and I say that if the commissioners find um, the objections no, to the lawnmower ban persuasive, then we recommend adopting an ordinance with an exception for residential lawnmowers. So um, that's, that's where we are. Ed, if I could, I'd like to throw a couple things out. I know this is my first meeting that I'm here with this topic, and um, I, I found an article in the Washington Post from this past Christmas Day, and it seems like a lot of um, a lot of locations that are doing this are specifically targeting leaf blowers because they are really bad. There's, um, I think it was the California. Um, let me find it. California. There's a California group. Um, well, interesting, though. California, they're banning the sale of gas-powered things. They're not banning the use. Of, if you already have one, they're not saying you have to get rid of everything. And they set aside $30 million, though, to help residents and businesses convert if they wish. I don't know. It didn't go into any details as to how that $30 million is going to be used, but they're recognizing that to force a, uh, you know, a property owner who's got a perfectly good piece of equipment to get rid of it 
it is a cost to them. Um, but they've, they've estimated that um, using a gas-powered lawnmower for one hour is the equivalent of driving 300 miles. But to use a leaf blower for one hour is the equivalent of driving 1,100 miles. God. Okay, so I think we need to, in my opinion, focus on the, the big items. I am one who cuts my own grass. It literally takes me 15 to 20 minutes. I have a gas-powered lawnmower. When it dies, I have no problem going out and buying a battery-powered lawnmower. I personally don't want to be forced to get rid of it early because that does provide that does create a different issue. You have to, and it was my husband at the last meeting that was pointing out, we have to drain the oil that's in there and get that taken away from a hazmat perspective, drain the get any leftover gas, and then you've got to um, you know, get the lawnmower disposed of. The city doesn't pick up lawnmowers. You might be able to pay $75 for a bulk pickup, but they don't normally pick them up because they also don't know if they've been properly drained. And if you take them to the landfill, they have you put them in a special place because you, you, know, you can't just throw them in the landfill. So I, you know, I personally think we should start with leaf blowers um, because they are, they are horrible. Um, you know, uh, the other thing would be the, um, the, the chainsaws. I will tell you, we had a large oak in the front of our house that died that had to be taken down. And the tree company we used, they were already using the battery powered, um, saws to the extent that they could. And they would take, you know, they would take them up in the tree and if they had a small limb, they used the battery. If they had a large limb, they used the gas powered. Um, and they pointed out that from the standpoint of being able to continue doing this for a long time, it's a lot for them to start and it hurts their shoulders. So they are more than happy to use the gas or the battery powered when it's appropriate. Yeah, we did hear from the, the major yep. Yep. Uh, contractors and the other thing that, um, I, I thought was persuasive to me as far as banning is that the commercial operators have to replace their equipment have to do it fairly so fr regularly anyways. anyway. And most of them feel there's a lot of advantages for yep. battery operated yep. and they didn't seem to, the ones that we had for the most part agreed, didn't object in the, mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, the, the people, we heard several people, um, the people who, who are in favor um, were more in favor because of noise uh, nuisance, mm -hmm. um, um, but the people who were against, it was, it came down to their lawnmowers. And so, mm -hmm. um, to, you know, I, I have proposed and we, we all, we had, the people who were here agreed that we would phase out lawnmowers on this phase approach, but give the commissioners, um, you know, the option mm -hmm. of what they want to do with with yep. the residential lawnmowers. Yeah, there's a, I'll just mention a couple cities that have focused on leaf blowers. Um, Montclair, New Jersey, Burlington, Vermont, they all have seasonal bans on the leaf blowers. I guess, uh, you know, they're mostly used to get rid of the leaves. Um, so they have seasonal bans on it. Lexington, Massachusetts has a, a, has a leaf blower ban going into effect in 2025. Um, There's many. Um, yeah, and California's the first state to try and do something on a statewide basis, and obviously, if you're a, you know a large state, you can come up with this banning the sale concept, which obviously Rehoboth well, Beach certainly can't. Right. Do well, I mean, like Delaware is actually looking at the cars. So if yeah, Delaware, if Delaware concept. were to look at the sale, it would naturally result in everybody over time replacing yeah, their great. equipment. Um, but, I, you know, I, I don't like the idea of accelerating a, a different environmental issue in the disposal of lawnmowers that still work in order to, you know, to go out and buy a battery-powered one. Like I said, I'm more, I'm 
my plan is that when our lawnmower dies, we will gladly get a battery powered one. One can make the same <laughs> argument about leaf blowers though. I mean, if you've got a perfectly good leaf blower, well, I, I guess, powered, why do you make it banned? Well, my, my guess is that those also are being replaced frequently by the commercial folks that use them. Um, I, I don't know how many residents have gas-powered leaf blowers. I have a, we have a blower, but it's an electric plug-in. Um, so, and we got rid of our gas-powered weed whacker because it was too damn hard to start, <laughs> honestly. Um, um, but, you know. I, uh, two questions for me. Mary, you mentioned um, some relief for residents. Is that in this, in this proposal or not? Yeah, in the proposal? Yeah. Um, when you get to the end where it says committee recommendations, yep. um, I, I say the committee recommends that Rehoboth Beach adopt an ordinance that I drafted, um, but then at the end, I say that the only serious opposition that the committee has heard okay. regarding the proposal was from some residents that object to replacing gas-powered lawnmowers. If the commissioners find these objections persuasive, then the committee recommends adopting an ordinance with an exception for residential lawnmowers. So I, great. I, I just sort of like a, that. you know, we really want to ban the lawnmowers, but if, right. if you don't like that, um, then at least ban the, uh, the leaf blowers and other handheld but, equipment. Carolyn, can you, those two statistics that you just read, um, could you repeat those? The using a lawnmower for one hour is the equivalent of driving 300 miles. Using a gas powered leaf blower for one hour is the equivalent of driving 1,100 miles. I actually have that in my report that very, I say, using a gas powered leaf blower for one hour causes the same amount of pollution to be emitted into the air as does driving a 2017 Toyota Camry driving from Los Angeles to Denver, which spans roughly 1,100 miles. Perfect. Yeah. So first yep. page under page. pollution. I yeah. Know if you're mm -hmm. Able to find that. I, and then they say um, the other one about driving. It says 11 new cars for an hour. It was an EPA, a little EPA. Oh, and that, fun and fact. that may be more. This was California's statistic was the 100 miles, um, 300 miles. So, uh, Carolyn, did you have a specific change to these recommendations or an objection I, to any of them? I haven't actually read that whole thing because I didn't get it. Okay. I apologize. No worries. <laughs> no worries. I mean, I, I went back and re-listened to the meeting. And, you know, like I said, my only concern is the um, – I, I, I don't want to – I don't want to force something on the residents that actually causes a different environmental issue. Um, I do. You, do you feel as though this sort of caveat yeah, I think so. here covers yes. it? Yes, I think okay. so. And, and didn't we also give the residents to 2025, right? 2025. So, so it's not. So we. Right, but if let's say somebody happened to buy a new lawnmower last year, it's not going to be wore out on a 50 by 100 lot where you're using it for 15 to 20 minutes a week. It's not going to be worn out by 2027. Yeah, but I get um, that the lawnmowers are followed by lawnmowers, so we're not we haven't discussed that, right? So what haven't we discussed? The follow, the lawnmowers of the date because it. it it's no, not we, clear we, to me by that that the lawnmowers are it's followed by lawnmowers. So I have lawnmowers in the proposed ordinance. She, yeah, she's I didn't got see it here. Twenty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Twenty twenty seven. Got that. So I actually would like. I don't know. My my view is is that's too soon for um, the lawnmowers for the residents because I. I like I said, a lawnmower that you're using 15 to 20 minutes a week, um, if, if you happen to have bought it last year, is not going to be worn out by 2027. Well, let, let me ask I'd you like this. I'd like to see lawnmowers removed for the residents, but I think you will find a lot of residents, when they have to replace their lawnmower, will, will replace it with a battery power given the exp how much gas is costing these days. Well, let's... 
let's hold on that for mm -hmm. a second and then I'll, I'll survey mm -hmm. the committee. But I'd like to hear from the public um, if you want to say anything. I, uh, if you could, it's on. If you could just state your name um, and who you're with. She has like small properties, but if you drive along uh, Oak Avenue, those people have a uh, large properties there. So I, I was talking to my brother, and in order to ban the flowers, I'm agree to do that. But I think it has to be seasonal because during the uh, the fall, we don't have a lot of people here. Right. And those people are coming from another state, and those people are complaining about the noise. I've been talking a lot uh, uh, to a lot of my customers. They don't want to pay more money, and because they are looking for a lower price. But in order to buy more uh, blowers, like the uh, battery blowers, we have to spend more money, a thousand of dollars. And they give us only like uh, 40 minutes to perform the job, and then we have to wait for like another. I think like another 40 minutes to recharge it again. And then imagine if we have to mow 40 or 45 properties around here, we have to spend more money for labor. So if Rehoboth passes a business rule, we don't have no choice. We have to increase our prices, labor, and job. So, for me, it's okay to ban the blowers, but like season. So because during the uh, like October to uh, this uh, two months, like uh, January and then uh, this month, uh, we have to do like a lot of cleanups and we don't have a lot of people living here right now. So I'm okay like during the summer. So, um, the, so then we can have the opportunity to blow a lot of, uh, of the properties during the, uh, the winter and then the fall. So that's my opinion right now. So, so like I say, if your robot passes the this new rule, we don't have no choice. So we have to increase our prices to keep working here. We have uh, we have been working here for, for like fifty years. So we we I, I like to keep doing this. Mr. Ventura, so you're saying um, ban leaf blowers from like May to September? Like October, because uh, October is that's uh, the month uh, the leaves are having uh, problem with those. Uh, that's what he wanted. And there, then if you go and if, if you drive along uh, Oak Avenue, those people, they have a large property. And so it looks fun, like blowing leaves, but those leaves are heavy. And those and those uh, blowers, they don't have a, they, they're not powerful to, to blow those leaves. So and, that's my opinion right now. So like yeah. I said, and then the other thing is we have to protect uh, those uh, blowers because they are not uh, waterproof. So we, what, I, what I'm thinking is if, they, if Rehoboth uh, passes this law, we have to buy the uh, enclosure price to protect everything. And then we don't have, we don't have much space to, for the parking lot. Yeah. That's the other thing. I, I hear what you're saying about having to raise the cost, but I think everybody, if we pass this law, everybody will be having to pay that cost. And we talked with some other landscapers who said that they, again, this would increase the cost, but to have more equipment. So while one is being charged, you can charge while you're going out and using the other one. Um, you know, that's an alternative to waiting the 40 minutes kind of thing. But of course you have to raise, you have to raise your rates, but if, but everybody will be having to raise their rates, so. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, people here that uh, they don't have like a lot of money and they they don't want to pay like, uh, they say they have like small property to mow the, uh, their lawn, but then when I when I talk to them and then I give the price to them, they they they're saying this price is expensive. 
Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course you have to. And I mean, that's most people I think can afford it, but you know, I'm starting to feel like we're really going over the same ground that I, I mean it's so repetitive we thank you sir um, for being here I, I've at, at the point now where I don't feel like I want to do any more work on this issue <laughs> I've spent a lot of time everything he said I talked about the increased upfront cost but that should level out over the lifespan with a reduction in fuel and maintenance expense and we've heard from other landscapers who say the same thing we had a lot of people in both pro and con we're just revisiting the same issues over and over again, and I think it's time to move it out of this committee and into the commissioners. They can do what they want, but I am not willing to go back and, and, and redo and retweak for like the fourth time. Um, I think it's, it's just gone on too long. I move that we send this forward. I agree with you, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> you want to second my motion? No. <laughs> I agree that we. Uh, Charlie, if you could just get closer oh, to I'm the sorry. mic. I move that we adopt the Mary's draft and send forward to the commissioners and the mayor for their consideration. Second that. Uh, we have a uh, motion to adopt the proposal um, as before us, um, and it's been uh, seconded by Joe Vessio. Um, any other comments, last words from the committee? I'd like to see a change in the date on the lawnmowers for the property owners or removal of the lawnmowers for the property owners altogether, either one. Is there any appetite to do that by the motioner? Not by me. Anybody else want to uh, suggest that? Well, I, I think that Mary's um, ad addition to that last paragraph kind of covers that, where she says that if it's... I don't know your exact words, but it says if the mayor and commissioners are not on board with um, banning uh, lawnmowers, that we take that off the off yeah. the table. Because there's going to be a whole process if it gets that far. Um, if the commissioners get our recommendations and say, "Oh, this sounds good," let's let's put it out there, um, and that's a big if. But if they did, um, <laughs> instead of just like shuffling it off somewhere, like Charlie's. Pollinator gardens or whatever it was that you said. I'm not giving up on <laughs> But if, if they actually to took this thing and said, you know, I'm going to put it out to the public, um, then there's a whole other opportunity for um, people to come in with. And, and, the, and it's, a, it's a technology that's rapidly um, improving all the time. There could be a whole bunch of new facts that we don't have by the time this comes forward. So I think um, that... I've, I've tried to leave it a little bit open-ended for them because I know there's going to be more if, if it even gets that far. I agree. I, I certainly agree that I think a lot of people don't pay attention to us. Um, and then once we, it goes to the mayor and commissioners, they start paying more attention and, and there will be more public, public input. It, it's on the news every morning that we have a committee meeting that we're going to talk about gas-powered equipment because so, people ask me are you talking about that again so um well we we have a motion and a second on the floor it doesn't sound like there's any appetite to change the motion um so i'll go ahead and, and take a vote uh joe yes mary yes charlie yes nettie yes eric yes carolyn i'll vote yes Okay, uh, and the chair abstains, uh, and the motion carries. Um, so this will go before the mayor and commissioners. Um, I, I, I don't know um, what was next on the agenda, but Eric, will, will your update be less than a couple minutes? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm sorry, Eric. Did I say Joe? I'm, no, I don't know. Eric. Eric. <laughs> I seriously feel like I'm well, lost. To, to I'm lost guys today. We got up here. You know, um, it's easy to confuse him, you know. I, I may be taking this out of sequence, but I'm going to ask Eric to talk about uh, recycling programs in cities that he has investigated. Yeah, just to 
to reiterate what, what I, or the question. Thank the, you, guys. The commitment I took was to investigate what other coastal towns are doing around recycling of plastics, bottles, aluminum cans, and, uh, and debris. Um, so I made a couple phone calls, and this was a while ago, so, and I noticed I'm not the best note taker, but um, so I decided to call Bethany Beach. Um, figured it was a close town similar to ours. Um, we, I talked to a fellow, Brett Warner, and I had a series of questions, um, but immediately um, my first question is, do you recycle other than res residential? And the question was no. Um, so similar to talking to him for probably a half hour, um, I think he's got the same struggles we have as well. Um, with, you know, they, they, one, can't get a, uh, a truck up, up on their boardwalk. So it's, it's more work. They don't have the labor to sort the materials. So they just kind of do, I think, the, as I remember, they do the main drag they're coming in and they don't do the boardwalk. Um, so, and I think he said, he, he says he's had discussions with, uh, with Mayor Mills and Kevin, and he, said, he, he was a fellow that knew quite a few people in Rehob uh, Rehoboth Beach. So. Um, so then the second one I decided to do was uh, call Ocean City. And I spoke to a lady called Tina, Tina Henderson, and the same question. And she said, no, we do not do that. Uh, she goes, and then seriously, she said it would take $3 million to start that program up. But what she did tell me, which is kind of near and dear to my heart and kind of along the lines of, of, of uh, ways of creating electricity is, is they have behind the 65th Street, they have behind the police station, they take all their trash there and, and it goes all up to Covanta. Covanta is a trash to steam. Uh, so they don't recycle. They just take everything there, trash to steam, puts energy back on the grid. <clears throat> and, and so, you know, so they get credits for that. Um, I was on a project within industry. A lot of industries do that as well. Um, so, you know, because you get those credits. But so to me, that sounded extremely interesting to me. So, you know, so, so you, you, we could take away, we could put the glass bottles up there. I think things are easy to, to recycle. I'm just thinking out loud to what I'd like to propose um, is, you know, we could, we could put the glass bottles, the aluminum cans, um, get recycled. My, and, and in my work, you know, with the industry, I, th those are the easy ones, um, the low-hanging fruits, I think, for recycling. As far as all the plastics, you know, you got the LDL, the, you know, the, the lightweight plastics, the heavyweight plastics, all that, you know, so... If we had a place, you know, if so, so maybe we could do that small recycling. But my suggestion for for the town is is maybe to take a visit. She offered the, to bring me there, take a look at it in the summer. They do twenty two to twenty four tons, I believe, a week. I don't know, maybe a day. You know, in the season. So I don't in the season. Now I could be wrong, but I've got twenty two. Like I said, I didn't take the best of notes here when I it was fresh in my mind two months ago when I made this phone call. But uh, so, you know, my suggestion is, is to look at that because to me, that's, that's right in line what we're talking. You know, we're trying to reduce our carbon impact. You know, it, 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 the incinerators are, are, are non has incinerators. They're regulated just like incinerators. And, you know, so it's part of the sustainable, you know, that, that we could, that we could promote, you know, along with the gas powered, but it's just a investigation, I think, that, you know, whether we take a field trip or whether we ask uh, Kevin Williams to go, go down there and have a chat with him, but she is tickled pink about that process, so. I like that idea. Yeah, it, and it's, it's something that I'm familiar with from, you know, as soon as she said, I, she goes, oh, we'd try to see him. I said, you go to Covanta, don't you? So, and, 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 you know, they talk about the, the Covanta is up in, it's in Chester, PA. Hmm. Um, not, not the best part of PA, but, you know, and, then, and a lot of folks were talking about the trash trucks, you know, you drive it, you know, the recycling, you got to resort, just all the gas, you know. So, so if you had a one-stop shop there, so great. I, I liked it. Um, and I just, and I stopped there. <laughs> I was going to call, I was going to call over in New Jersey, and I was just like, 
you know, to me, this, this, this rings a bell with me. I, 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 I would fully support that. I don't know that town would, and I think it would be good advertisement, you know, that we, we not only recycle, but we yeah. put power back into the grid. You know, so the whole idea is they burn that, the turbines, and then they make the electrical panel. The electric, I, so. How big is this thing? Um, the cogen? Yeah. I mean, a Cavanta? Yeah. Oh, there, there, it's... I mean, there's one in Plymouth, Plymouth Town, Township, Pennsylvania that's huge. Huge. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've been to the one, I have not been to the one in Chester. I visited the one in Buffalo because I got some waste streams coming from when I worked for W.L. Gore. I got some non-has waste streams and, and had that sent up in Buffalo. You know, it's a pretty simple thing. The trucks come in, unload. They, they kind of have their sorters looking for paints or whatever, and it's a big claw, picks up, goes into the incinerator, incinerator, you know, generates the heat, the heat turns the turbines, and then you got electricity. Looks and like they're in Ocean City? No, they, so they have a deal with Covanta. Oh. So that, I don't know how that works. I think there's trucks there that they maybe fill. I, I did not get the details, but she offered me, to, you know, I wanted to talk kind of have this discussion before I ride. I mean, I'm interested. I, I certainly would take her, yeah, would certainly would love to take a ride. She told me right where it was, told me, give me a call, let me know when you're coming, I'll take you through the system, you know, so. They're all over the country. Uh, oh, they're, uh, Covanta's, yeah. it's, and mostly on the East Coast. Um, they're, they're, you know, so Germany, you know, Germany doesn't, you know, I went over to Germany, Germany doesn't landfill. They, this is what they have. They have trash. This they is have a lot of land to landfill. Huh? Yeah. Well, you know, they've been doing that. They've been doing that since like 2005. They stopped all landfills. You know, I, I can tell you this. Also, I brought something else. So I work for Merck. Merck and has 20 by 2025. 2025. No more than 20 percent of the operating waste will be sent to landfills, and in, and incinerators with no inc energy recovery. So, so that's the way one of the big businesses, by 2025, at 50% of the sites will send zero waste to the landfills. And that's just not, that's just not Merck. There, there's, there's all kinds of sustainability projects for, for DuPont, for you know, the ICIs, all that. So it, it's, to me, it's a way of, of the future. You know, it's, it's, you, you, you can't, it's sustainable. You can't just keep filling landfills, you know, and, and if we can, Send it to, we don't, there's very few incinerators that have this uh, capabilities, but they are quite a few there are, on, so. on the East Coast. Massachusetts, New York. And they have great Iowa, programs. Georgia, North well, Carolina, if, if, Virginia. I, 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 you guys are all environmental experts, so I, forgive me if I'm a tad bit ignorant. No. So this would, and this discussion about recycling really stemmed from is it working or not um, in the, the public areas. So this essentially would take away a recycling program in our public areas and everything would be commingled? So they would take normal trash. Um, and I'm not saying do away with, you know, I think like I say, the, the easy ones are the bottles. You know, it's the bottles pizza and bottles, can, bottles, and cans. bottles and cans. You can. I've been very successful at my at my work with that. You know, so I'm not saying that we can keep the bottles and cans, real pretty ones. Just have little small areas where you can put a bottle in and a can in. And this would be for the the normal trash, the town's trash. Do they put plastic in those things? They do. And also, I, re I remember Kevin saying that the recycling bins especially on the boardwalk, were being used for much more than um, yeah, cans, well, pizza boxes, and yeah. diapers. Right. And I think they need to have a way to prevent, to get a pizza box in, you got to lift the lid off. Yeah. And you can. Yeah. If they had a way to secure those lids so that they weren't easily lifted, yeah. they, so they, that would certainly That help. would prevent the pizza boxes, I believe. So, yeah. Go ahead, Ed. And Ed, I think they have need to have enough trash cans beside the recycle bins, like have two trash cans and a recycle bin mm -hmm. so that you don't get up there, see the trash overflowing, and say, oh, well, I'll just stick Put it, it in, in here. here. Yeah. yeah, and I think there need to be more. I mean, I don't know what's happening with our recycling you know, bins that we have on the boardwalk. But I think there need to be more of them. And it, like you say, Carolyn, needs to have a trash can every single avenue, a trash can and the recycling and, place and so they you do, can and do And they it. do. When you yeah. walk down the boardwalk, every beach crossing has both. 
No, they don't. Yeah, no. 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 Well, this time of year, they do have, I'm 99% sure, at the end of the, okay, let me, at the end of the they, street. So if yeah, there's they, a crossing in the middle, at the end of the streets, they have a trash can and they have a recycle mm, can. Not on Because I walk it every day. Okay, I've walked okay? it too, and they're not um, on every single and you one. See, you see both, <laughs> but, I think in the summer, the trash overflows, and so people say, well, then I'm just going to stick yeah. it in here. But I guess what, you know, if we follow what Eric was saying, then um, it's a moot point because right. all that would be lumped together, yeah. right, Eric? Yeah. Correct. And it wouldn't matter. Right. So Right, it wouldn't matter. It's a, it's a plus. Uh, it's a plus. Uh, it's 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 sustainable. It's, it's, it's putting power into our grid. You know, you we may not generate the... The you know the benefits of it, but uh, well, didn't you say that they the Ocean City gets credits back? Well, companies do. I don't oh. know. Ocean City does not. I I, I don't I don't know. It's all I know. Okay. Is, so we probably need to. I just kind of made the phone call and I stopped at that point and I wanted to okay. chat with the team yeah. and that see if there's more work that we want to do. If there's more phone calls, you know, field trips, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just because well, I, I like the idea. It. I think it's I like definitely it. worth investigating further. I think mm -hmm. we should talk to Kevin Williams and get exactly. his thoughts. Exactly. There's yeah. a, yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. he was the one that says, you know, it, you know, we have all these recycling, but I can't remember the exact number, but he said, like, we're successful about 45% of it. Right. No, like 65% right. right. of it is mixed up. That's what everyone says. It's the same thing. They can't sort it. They don't have the people to sort it. To start that program back up and, and there, they said it was 2 to $3 million back in Ocean City, and they just like this process. They pay for them to come. We have a place to put our waste. They come take it, boom, and we pay per pound. It used to be, I don't know, way back when, $1. twenty, you know, something a pound to burn. Well, let, let me, let me I, I need to wrap this up in three minutes. Go I've got another, another meeting, um, and I apologize, Nettie, Finally, did so much work to get her hers in the right Mary, Mary format. No. And I thought uh, I was only going to be five minutes, so I apologize. I <laughs> but um, I promise, Nettie, you will be first on the agenda Thank you. at our next meeting. Because talk about. Yeah. Um, but I would like to Always just solidify. made never a bride. I'd like to solidify our, our path forward for this. It seems like everyone thinks that the idea that um, Eric had with this company and the capabilities of it is fantastic something we should research. Yes. So Eric, I think you and I could sit down with Kevin. May invite him um, to the next meeting. Yeah, I, I'm fine. The, and, however and we, can however that we want to, but, but I, I don't, yeah. But and come back. To just an initial, an initial talk about it. And then we'll definitely have him at our next meeting to discuss publicly. But secondly, how this all started is, <laughs> are we recycling the right way? Um, and we're not because the contamination is, it's well over 65%, at least during the summer. Um, and the question from Kevin is, do we buy more recycling bins? Do we continue this? Is it worth it? Um, what do other cities do that are able to recycle without as much contamination? How's the signage? What type of buckets are they? So do we just forget about that or do we yeah. uh, the things I we ha, we had a report that came out like maybe 2010 or something we actually spent some money to figure out what was going wrong with we had ha, tried to implement um, recycling on the beach and the, the striking thing is when you read the report is that they concluded the biggest problem was that the, the, the bins were confusing for people and that they weren't, and, and even to this day, I sometimes look at what we have and say, now, what goes in, is this the recycling, or is this, you know, you have to really study it and look at it, and, and so that's just a... I have, to, I have to take my recycling waste out of the bag, because, you know, yeah. I don't have a trash can that I'm just going to throw soda cans, yeah. beer cans, whatever it may be, bottles. All right, I'm going to let Nettie have the last word here, and then I need to wrap this up. Do we, and I showed... Uh, it was probably several years ago, the committee. Dewey has a very simple, very effective, and absolutely clear system. They have four bins at every single avenue. And those bins, they're plastic barrels. It's not frou-frou. It's not fancy. But 
bottles are in one, I mean, glass is in one, plastic is in another, metal is in another, and trash, you know, paper is in another. And it, it is totally clear, and there was no confusion. And I took it every single, I took pictures well, at I different think places. I would be glad to call them to see yeah, the success. I think, please, yeah, please, please, please do that. So I'm going to move this forward in, and we can do it at the same time, but in two different topics. Uh, our recycling program in public here, and maybe we just stick with bottles and cans um, in very small, tight holes. Yeah. Um, put a sticker on it that says bottles and cans. But I'm going to move this forward in sort of two different, two different topics, if, if that makes sense to you all. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, our next, um, I'm sorry, I have to cut it off there. Our next meeting date will be, um, we'll continue this now, the third Thursday, one o'clock, uh, going forward indefinitely. Um, I thank you all for changing your schedule. Um, I thought Friday mornings would work well, but the, the mayor changed some budget meetings um, at the same time. Uh, so this works well for me, so I, I appreciate it um, with all of you.